As a professor, the worst part of my job is dealing with cheating, with academic dishonesty. This has always been a problem, but it's gotten worse during the online learning that's been present in the pandemic. And frankly, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of fighting against a $15 billion industry that supports cheating in university. I'm tired of being DM'd by people offering to pay me money to help them cheat. I'm not going to do it. So in this video, I really want to unpack what is going on in the world of cheating at universities. Cheating isn't one thing. There are many different types of behaviors, some more egregious than others. And I like to think of it a bit as a spectrum of different types of behaviors where you're trying to get help. On one end of the spectrum, you have behaviors that are clearly cheating. Things like you're paying someone else to do your homework or write an essay for you, or you're sneaking notes into an exam. I once had a student that fabricated an entirely fake exam by looking at my past exams. They snuck the fake exam into the exam room, swapped the real one with their fake one, and then hilariously failed their own fake exam. A scam that was only going to last for about 10 seconds until I read it the first time and realized it was the wrong exam anyways. But the point is, obviously cheating. But then on the other end of the spectrum, there's many different behaviors where you're just trying to get help and it's not cheating. You might be watching some YouTube videos, like my ones perhaps are going to help teach you the material, or ask a classmate whether you can review their notes on a day that you were sick. Getting help is not a problem in and of itself. And then in the middle, there's actually some admittedly gray areas where you're getting some level of help, but is it cheating or is it not? For example, in my classes, I'm a really big fan of collaboration, and I want my students to collaborate together on the homework. But if you're just going to take your friend's homework and just sort of copy it symbol by symbol down, not only is this not effective for your learning, you're sort of missing the point of doing homework, but it's also a type of cheating. Now, exactly where the lines get drawn actually does depend on the individual professors and the policies of the institution and the courses that you're part of. So pay attention to them to know whether or not you're crossing any lines. Now, cheating in university is a big dollar business. Some estimates are perhaps $15 billion industry. To put that in perspective, that is more money than YouTube pays every single creator combined in ad revenue in any given year. So a lot of people are making a lot of money off of cheating. The most common form of cheating that I deal with in online courses is called contract cheating. This is where you pay somebody money to solve your homework or test problems for you. In my field of mathematics, you can just upload a problem for pretty much any type of math in the first couple years of university, and there will be people who will be able to answer that and give you a solution within just a couple of minutes. Contract cheating is now such a big problem because if you're willing to do it and you've got the money, it's very easy to do. And the industry is kind of pernicious. Sometimes you'll have one company that will own hundreds of different sort of front websites that market themselves to all sorts of different niches, but it's the same company in the background. And sometimes what will happen will be, say you're trying to get editing help on your essay. So you submit your essay and maybe they're going to give you some editing help, maybe it sounds perfectly benign. But then that company also owns another company and they're going to take your essay and they're going to sell it to somebody else, perhaps in your same class, and you're actually going to be supporting the academic dishonesty even though you didn't know this was even happening. There are examples where if you cheat once, then those companies are going to keep on harassing you for more and more money, sometimes even blackmailing you by saying they're going to let people know that you cheated unless you gave more money. It's a pernicious industry. The part that gets me the most is actually the marketing, which you can find everywhere, including sometimes in the ads for videos on this very channel. And the thing about the marketing is, they act as if they're there for you, that they're being supportive for you, that they're going to help you in these challenging times, it's going to be stress-free, and they're going to be effective for your learning. A lot of these companies sell themselves not as cheating companies, but to support your learning. And the cheating, even though it's the primary purpose, the primary reason anyone would spend money, it's being sold to you for much nicer and supportive reasons. So how common is this kind of cheating anyways? For contract cheating, where you're paying somebody to solve your problems for you, a systematic review looked that over decades, the estimated amount has been perhaps 3.5%, but that more recently, 2014 to 2018, it's jumped as high perhaps as 15%. 
And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that in the switch to online learning, the numbers have actually jumped up as well, where now there's online final exams, for instance, as opposed to in-person final exams that are just harder to cheat on. This is in contrast with more minor types of cheating, like for example, taking a completed assignment that you've done and sharing it with somebody else to go and work on. This is something that 27% of university students have admitted that they've done. So the point here is that the more egregious types of cheating are rarer than sort of more common and less egregious types. And I think it's important to note here that most people don't do the more egregious types of cheating. And I think this is important because Sometimes if you think everybody else is sort of cheating in the most egregious kind of way, then you're like, well, I may as well too. I don't want to get too far behind the pack. But in truth, while it's a problem and, and there's this huge industry to support it, it is still a limited problem nevertheless. Okay, so should you cheat? Look, I'm not here to moralize or to be paternalistic here. But I do think that a lot of students have a few underlying confusions in their sort of risk reward analysis. So well, let me share some of my thoughts as a university professor. The first thing that I think students just regularly misunderstand is just how bad it is if you happen to be caught. So most universities that I've worked at have a very large and robust academic integrity policy. And for many of them, the consequences can rise to being pretty severe pretty darn quickly. So for example, the worst case of cheating that I've ever had in a single exam of 300 students was 11 people caught in that one exam. This was an exam that allowed calculators, and there's a slot between the back of the calculator and its case, and people will often go and try to put notes in that slot. So we just checked that slot, caught 11 different people. Because this is a final exam, if for a first offense, this meant you failed the assessment that you cheated on. This is 11 people who spent four months of their lives, who spent tuition, and now have a permanent F on their transcript, contributing to the GPA to get rewarded, for the slipping in of a few notes. And then on the flip side, you think, well, hold on, if I didn't catch them, how much would those notes really even have helped them? I mean, if you're a student in calculus, say, and you don't remember any of the basic formulas and you would need those notes to be able to help you, you're probably not gonna do well anyways. So you have this extremely harsh punishment for the first offense, it goes up from there, in exchange for a pretty marginal, perhaps like a few percent better on your final exam. I just don't think the math works out. Secondly, I think a lot of students underestimate how good I am and how good other professors are at catching their cheating. I think a lot of people think they're just unlikely to get caught and it's not true. So I've had many, many meetings with people that I've caught and accused of cheating and they come speak to me and many of them are quite flabbergasted that I actually was able to catch it. Now, a magician never reveals their secrets, so I'm sorry, I'm not gonna tell you all the tricks that I have to be able to catch different students. But the point is that I've been doing this for a very long time, and so I've seen many of the patterns of student behaviors. And so it's a lot easier for me to catch people and to use a bunch of tools to be able to catch them than I think people really give me credit for. I'll give you one hint. In a big class, I might be grading final exams of 500 or 1,000 or even more students depending on the class. And when you grade, say, a thousand papers, a thousand copies of a single question, you get really familiar with the types of responses that the average student is going to give. And so something weird sticks out like a sore thumb. So for example, two papers that look the same, well, I'm probably going to notice that these two papers are very, very similar, and I'm going to go back and remember, oh, I seem to remember half an hour ago, I saw a solution that was just like this, and then I can investigate whether or not I think cheating actually happened. Or if you use a solution from one of these sort of contract cheating websites, it's just a little weird, say it uses a technique that I didn't teach in course, I'm gonna immediately notice this and it's gonna motivate me to investigate it. These things are just so much more obvious when you grade in large scales than for an individual student just writing down one solution. Suppose you do manage to cheat and I don't catch you and it does help you and now you've managed to pass the test that you wouldn't have otherwise. But does this really help you? For example, I teach calculus. So there's four different calculus courses in a row, calculus one to calculus four, and they're incredibly logically dependent on it. To be honest, I don't really care if somebody cheats on the first homework of calculus one, cheats on the first test of calculus one, because if you need to cheat to get through those basics, I know you're gonna fail later on. It's just a very high probability. Indeed, homework, which has a lot of the more sort of benign types of cheating, sort of copying off of other students and the like. Well, homework is a formative assessment. Formative meaning 
It's there for you to practice and to develop your skills so that you're prepared to write the tests and the exams. So if you're regularly cheating on the homeworks, the chances are you're not building up that skill set to do well on the tests and the final exams where often it's a little bit harder to cheat. And so it can feel good in the moment, like it's, it's a way to get that small percentage for the homework right now when you're struggling and don't know what to do, but it's going to pay off and end up hurting you in the long run. There's also this sort of like psychological sense where, you know, if you start playing a game and then you look up the cheat code and then you almost can't get away from the cheat code, like you just keep on using the cheat code over and over and over again. It's the same sort of psychological thing. If you're like, I can avoid putting in the work by cheating, you do it once at the beginning because you're like, I'm, I'm desperate, I'm stuck, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to fail this homework. But now you're more and more likely psychologically to keep on doing it for the long run while also having less and less effect of learning and as a result, needing to do the cheating a little bit more. Now look, I do not like failing students. It's definitely a frustrating part, particularly a student I've, I've worked with a lot and built a strong relationship. I hate when I have to fail students. But the truth of the matter is that sometimes it is the right thing to fail somebody. For example, in the calculus sequence, it's well established that students who really struggle in calculus one typically will go on to struggle in calculus two. In contrast, a student that fails calculus one, if they sort of like buckle down and they get some breathing room and they learn some more effective strategies, and now that second time they learn calculus one pretty well, those students actually surprisingly go on to do pretty darn good in calculus two, statistically speaking at least. So the point is, if you're right on that margin between passing and failing, and you think, well, I could cheat and therefore I'm gonna get the pass, you might just be delaying the fail until the next semester, where if you take it back and you try everything again, you learn it properly, you're just gonna feel so much better and your math anxiety is gonna be better and everything's gonna work out better for you. So if everything I just said, the whole case for why you shouldn't cheat is just so obvious, why do so many people cheat? Well, it's a lot of different reasons, I think. Sometimes I meet students in our meetings and I actually end up having a lot of sympathy for them. Often students are just really struggling either academically or in other aspects of their life. And struggle has been a big part of the pandemic as well. There's, there's been more students in this category where there's just a lot of things happening and, and academia is extremely stressful right now. In this, in this context, cheating sort of becomes a, a safeguard or a sort of a fallback option. I've worked with students where I'm pretty convinced that they never wanted to cheat, that, that this was not how they intended to go about their university career, but they got themselves stuck in a hard place and this just seemed to them like the only way to dig themselves out of it. And so they did. And, and while I might disagree, I think it is worth having empathy for a lot of these reasons why people might decide to cheat. Some of the factors that studies identify include things like the competitive learning environment, tremendous pressures to succeed from parents, a sort of credentialization of universities where there's, there's less value in the learning and, and more value just in the credential that you get sort of regardless of how you got there. Having lots of extremely high stakes exams, just broad unfamiliarity with what the rules and policies even are, what does and does not count as cheating, and just, as I mentioned, lots of underlying stress. Now, sometimes I do struggle to find empathy with some of my students. I remember recently posting a first quiz in the course. It was just sort of like a gimme quiz so that people could learn how the software worked. You just had to add two vectors. And if you don't know anything about linear algebra, you can probably still guess the right answer. And yet even this first just sort of gimme question on the first quiz, well, it itself was posted to a contract cheating website and somebody tried to cheat to get through that. Uh, I don't know, I think they were probably planning to cheat the entire way through the semester, regardless of some of these other factors that we were talking about. Okay, so what can we do about this? I know a bunch of my audience are other teachers and other professors, so how can we actually make this better? The most important things in my mind is creating a very supportive learning environment and building a strong relationship between the student and the instructors. I really like the relationship part because I try a lot to, to have a connection with my in-person students and to a lesser degree with all of you watching on YouTube as well. And I think this is important because there's a difference between saying, look, I'm going to cheat in just a, a random course and I'm going to cheat on Trevor, this person who I know cares about me, who has worked with me and has been together with me in office hours and hopes the best for me. When you have that strong personal relationship, it feels more like cheating on the person 
than cheating on the circumstance of the course. And, and, and so this personal connection actually disincentivizes a bunch of people from cheating. And that supportive learning environment is so important because as we've mentioned, a lot of cheating happens because that's where they think the supports are. If you have a class that has a lot of different supports where people are comfortable, they can get help, they can deal with sort of the anxiety of struggling on something and not know how to move forward, and there's places where they can go that are gonna support that. If that's all possible in the class, then it turns people away from these pathways that lead to cheating. And indeed, one study found that one of the leading causes of cheating was just dissatisfaction with the learning and teaching environment that they were experiencing. And if you really don't like or care about the professor and the course that they're having about, yeah, it makes sense that you'd be more likely to cheat because you're just trying to get the grade. The other factor that was identified, and it makes sense, is just opportunities to cheat. And indeed, in online learning, there's very often more opportunities to cheat than in in-person learning. And I've really noticed amongst professors that there's been a, a bunch of different approaches as to how to change your course to have less opportunities to cheat. And sometimes there's a little bit of a balance as to whether you're gonna do something that makes your class in some sense worse, the learning environment worse, but also harder to cheat on. I'll give an example. This would be tests that are sort of one-way tests where you, where you see a problem, you have a couple minutes to do it, you can't go back on it. That might block a lot of the types of contract cheating, but it's a higher stakes, more stressful type of test and, and somewhat contributes to a, a more anxious learning environment. And so I personally don't do that. I prefer things like, for example, lowering the stakes of any given test, having more frequent lower stakes assessments throughout the course. So you can be like, I, I can screw this up, that's okay. I can come back and relearn and, and do better going forward. A final thing that could be quite helpful is just having conversations kind of like the one I'm having right now with your students, being clear what is academic integrity, what does it mean, why does it matter, what is allowed and what is not allowed. This is going to help deal with some of the lack of clarity and confusions that can arise as to whether someone is or is not on one side of the line. If they know you care, then at least they're going to be thinking about it and perhaps responding accordingly. Are these things going to stop all the cheating in the world? Uh, of course not but they can make a difference. They can reach some students, and so I think it really helps. And besides, worst case scenario, mostly what I said is just be a good teacher. You should be doing that anyways. Now, I wanted to close by talking a little bit about me and, and how this cheating all affects me. Because the truth of the matter is, I actually really do get affected about it. Because I really care about my students, right? I've mentioned this before. I put a lot of effort into trying to support my students and to get them through my course. And I know that when a student cheats in my course, it's not personal. It's, it's not a personal statement about me as a human being. But it feels personal. It feels like I've tried so hard to connect, to do everything I can, and that even then it's just sort of being spat on and someone's cheating regardless. It's just how I feel. I really don't like dealing with it, I don't like meetings, I don't like giving punishments, I don't like any part of it. And maybe saying that is helpful, because you can realize the effect that the cheating can have on your professors, on, on people like me. It, it really is significant. In the summer of 2020, where I was dealing with an enormous amount in the immediate switch to online learning, I'll be honest, it, it really got me down and made me discouraged about teaching and learning, and, and I've kind of had to pick up the pieces and, and choose to care less about some things since then. What I like as a professor is, is the teaching part, is the community part. I mean, I like making YouTube videos that people can enjoy and watch and, and find some interest in mathematics in. I, I don't wanna be punishing somebody. I don't wanna be spending my time catching people and, and writing them up. That's not what interests me in learning. So your teachers are human as well, just like all of you are. Uh, keep that in mind. All right, so <laughs> that is my piece. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Perhaps share this with somebody that you think might also be interested in. And in the next video, I promise we'll get back to doing some more math.